so for the time being, I think I will cover a little bit of what uh, I did last time. Just just a you know set the stage here. Okay, kind of like what I talked about last time is uh, the basic structure of finding game networking. Um, this, we covered the fact that like when you press a button, something happens on screen, and you need to send that button input across the network so that the other player's uh, console or computer can reflect uh, the same thing that you saw on your screen, right? And the important thing was that to send that button press takes time, right? In the example here, 50 milliseconds, uh, about three or so frames to reach there, so there's a delay and your opponent will see uh, changes on their screen after a fixed amount of time. And uh, we have to do something about that delay, otherwise we run into a few different issues, which I covered. Um, one way we can solve those issues is to add uh, pre-buffer on those inputs so that you and your opponent see the same thing on screen at the same time just by delaying the input locally so that it matches the delay uh, over the network, to send the button press over the network. Uh, and uh, I talked about a few of those problems, obviously. You feel lag on your presses that doesn't feel great. Um, you need to adjust that input delay dynamically because uh, networking conditions can change. Uh, network latency is dynamic. It changes over time, so you need to compensate for that. Uh, and then I covered rollbacks and the problems with the rollbacks and how latency affects um, rollbacks. If there's more latency online, uh, the amount of rollbacks can increase. And I talked about the issue of dropping frames and uh, uh, this issue of unbalanced rollbacks or one-sided rollbacks and how to deal with that from a high-level point of view. Basically, the idea is that if one side drops a frame, you need to detect that frame was dropped and uh, slow your client side down or drop a frame technically so that your opponent's uh, computer or console can catch up to you so you stay in sync. And that's the general idea. That's a very high level viewpoint, but it doesn't really explain the specifics. And I didn't get into it last time because I didn't want to do any math. But this time, yeah, I'm going to do a little bit of math. I hope you're not scared of uh, any symbols or um, mathematical formula, uh, you know, formalisms, anything like that. But yeah, cool. Uh, I'm going to get started on a blank slate here. Uh, so, you know, this idea of synchronization. Like, what is synchronization, really? Well, let's just talk about something first. Let's talk about clocks. Why do we need to talk about clocks? Well, so how do actually video games update, right? We know this process of reflecting input on screen. You press a button, and you see an effect on screen. Cool. But did you want your game to only show things when you press buttons? No, your character needs to like jump through the air and they fall or they walk forward at like a fixed speed. All these things happen without you pressing inputs. So what is actually driving those updates? Well, those are those are clocks, right? So uh, so basically, we have our timeline like as before, and I had demonstrated uh, you know a lot of these things by uh, a grid, not really a grid, just a row of frames. And I think it's pretty intuitive to understand that like each of these frames reflect what you understand, you know, as a fighting game player, what a frame is, right? But, you know, when we read the inputs and reflect it on screen, what is actually driving that? Well, again, it's a clock. So, you know, frames, uh, you know, zero, I'll just count them out here real quick. Each of those frames are uh, updated from a signal from a clock that's actually on your CPU or somewhere else. So. Uh, I'm going to draw a little clock symbol here, or a time, timer or something, stopwatch. And just imagine, like, it's sending signals that's driving each of these frames, right? Every time a clock sends a signal, it updates the game. And when we update the game, we read input from the player. If we didn't have the clock, we wouldn't know when to update the game. And it's important for the clock to update at a fixed rate so we can get a consistent update on our screen. We, generally, we update fighting games at 60 hertz, or you know, more commonly people say 60 frames per second. Um, 
and that's about 16.667 milliseconds, give or take, right, roughly. That's our update rate. Uh, and we need a clock that can send a signal at that rate, right? The truth is, at uh, a lower level, the clock's actually updating much faster. I'm not really going to talk too much. I don't really need to talk about that aspect of it. It's too low level. But the important thing to understand is we need something that sends out a signal at a fixed rate. That's our clock. And we're going to call these signals, basically, ticks. It's just imagine, you know, you have a stopwatch that's making a sound like tick, 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 tick. Uh, and every time it ticks, we count. So uh, first tick, we say one, two for the second tick, three, four. And we count these ticks. And we expect these ticks to be uh, occurring at fixed intervals, right? And the fixed interval, in this case, is 16.666 whatever milliseconds. Or you can just say more directly, you know, <laughs> one sixtieth of a second. Okay, now that we have that covered, is that comprehensible for everybody here? I'm, I, I'm going a little slow, but I want everybody to follow along. Um, once we get to the other points, you need to have the space understanding. So you understand when I'm saying tick, you need to really understand what I'm talking about. I'm really just talking about the signals being sent from the clock, right? So, yeah, any questions there? Give everybody a moment, a second. We don't really see anything. Hopefully, nobody's asking anything. It's just you know not showing up in the chat or anything like that. Awesome. Yeah, because I'm using like this Twitch client thing. Sweet. Everything looks great. Awesome. So moving on now. Uh, I'm gonna start doing a little bit of math here. Okay. As I said before, when we get a signal from the clock, yes, one tick is one. In in our case, it's gonna be one sixtieth of a second. Okay, well, here's an important thing. I, I told you that we want those ticks at fixed intervals so we can count one, two, three, four, five, and so on. The problem is clocks are not necessarily always consistent, right? They don't always tick at fixed intervals that are the same among multiple clocks. And when we're talking about networking two game clients online, we're not necessarily going to have them update exactly the same time and at the same rate. So we have to do something about it to make sure they stay synchronized. And when I say, in this case, when I'm talking about synchronization, I'm talking about keeping those clocks ticking at the same time or as, at, as close as possible. Okay. And there's another issue on top of all this. Not only can the like clocks tick at different rates. So let, me, let me show you something here. They can start at the same time, but there, there, there are cases where they don't start at the same time. So I'm going to show you just two timelines here. Um, we're just going to count one, two, three, four, five. Let's assume this is like one clock here, right? Or one stopwatch here. Um, I've got another. I'm just going to draw them like this. <laughs> uh, and this starts earlier. So you can see these two clocks are just not synchronized, right? They start at different times. We need them to start at the same time. And this is something I'm going to talk about here pretty soon. But I just want people to understand the idea that clocks can be desynchronized. And you have to actually make effort to uh, make sure that our tick counts are the same at the same time. Now, the simplest thing you could do here is say the person with the first clock can say, oh, you know, maybe at tick number three they tell the person hey look my clock is now showing number three right at this time it's fine they hear you if they're very close to you oh okay i see that your clock is number three so the way we can synchronize in this case uh, for the second person is to actually hold their clock from ticking right so we can say we have a new timeline here where when, once they get the signal, say their clock is showing six when they get the signal, if both, assuming both clocks are ticking at the same rate, I don't really want to talk too much about how we solve dynamic tick changes for now, but for now, if we see that like 
I'm ahead, or my side is ahead at tick number six. I can tell because, you know, their clock's saying three. He told, you know, my, my friend told me their clock's at three. So I just need to stop my clock from updating in order to synchronize with him. And how long do we wait? Just six minus three, so three whole ticks, basically. So what we can do is draw a new timeline here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And instead of updating immediately, uh, we just synchronize with our friends. So we just wait until they've gotten to six. And then we let it update again here at seven. So now we are synchronized, right? Both our clocks are updating at the same time and reflecting the same number. This is important for fighting games because we obviously we want to reduce the amount of uh, one-sided rollbacks, as I explained before. We, we need our games to reflect the same input at nearly the same time. Is that part understandable? Uh, hopefully I explained it clearly enough. So the idea here, I guess I'll write it out, is in order to synchronize uh, a clock that's ahead, we have to hold it until another clock catches up. Right. Uh, I guess I can write that as a concept here. Whoops. Let me write that out, text. So, whooped. In order to synchronize two clocks, you hold you hold the current time on one on the on the clock that's ahead until the one which is behind uh well not <laughs> is ahead until the one which is behind one that is behind you can't catch catch up in order to synchronize two clocks you hold we hold, and that's to say we hold, the current time on the clock that's ahead until the one that is behind can catch up. I hope that's clear enough. Okay. Oops, not on screen. Sorry about that. Awesome. <laughs> Any questions there? Sweet. It's basic synchronization technique there. But anyway, we know that uh, I can tell you like what my clock saying right now, right? And it's showing uh, three or whatever. Uh, Necromancy asks, uh, I've always been a bit confused about how you synchronize two clocks very close together, but out by less than the ping. I'm gonna talk about, that's an issue of latency and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. Okay, so uh, as you know from what I talked about last time, it does take time to send information over the internet. Any distance, any significant distance, we can't just tell the person instantly that uh, what my clock is because by the time it gets to them, they're going to be far ahead. So we can't do this thing where, like, say they told me their clock's at 3, I wait until they get to 6, but by the time they... When they tell me their clock is six, if it takes time, let's say it takes like five whole clock ticks on my side to uh, receive that information, I'm going to be ahead again, right? I'm going to be at six plus five, you know. So what can we do about that? And I'm, I'm just going to write this out as like a double timeline again. So say we're here in the same scenario again, one, two, three, four. Well, sorry, yeah. Five, six, seven ticks on one side, and then on our side, again, we get to six and we hold. But the problem is, if we'd wait for them to tell us when they got to six, there's gonna be a delay. Let's just say it's a delay of two ticks, right? So they're gonna be on tick number eight by the time say that uh, we got it and we see that they're at six so we go okay let's update now let's let our clock keep running but if we just let it run at that point we're going to be behind now right because our next tick is seven 
but you know they're all they're already at eight or whatever this may be a little bit off but the idea is if we wait until a signal until they tell us um when they're on six we're gonna be behind right so because it takes time to send information and in, in this case an example it takes two whole clock ticks So what do we do? You know, how do we solve this problem? Well, we can measure how long it takes to send information, right? Um, online, on networks, everybody's familiar with ping. You know, the round trip time it takes to send a packet to one computer and receive uh, that signal or that message back, that is ping. Um, the round trip time for information. And if we measure that and say, oh, we know it takes two ticks to send information one side one way, we can then add that time to the information we used to receive from the other clock, right? So if the Say my friend has a, shows, shows a six on their clock. When we receive it later, we know it took two whole ticks to get to us. So we can guess that they're going to be at six plus two, eight. So we know it two ticks later after the information, they're going to be at eight. So we can actually calculate how long we need to wait, right? If we're at six, and uh, well, in this case, sorry. <laughs> so we we have to we have to be uh, have to be specified here that uh, let me jump back to actually when the first in us information at uh, frame number three. Sorry, went a little bit roundabout here. Uh, when we first we saw we were first skewed. So this timeline, I'm just gonna scratch this out because we are we are skewed here, right? Uh, my clock is ahead, there's behind, right? Let's say they sent us uh, what was on their clock when it said one. What well, took two whole ticks to get to us, right? And ours was at six. Well, again, we recorded the amount of time it takes to send information from back and forth. And it's two in our case, like two ticks have passed on our clock by the time we saw that their clock shows one. Well, if we know that, we know how long we need to wait, right? We know that they're at one, but it took two ticks to get to us, so we know they're currently at three. So how long do we wait to synchronize? Well, just this is count four, five, six. So we know we need to start syncing. We'll be synced if we wait until their clock shows seven. And how many ticks is that? Well, we already updated here at six, so we just need to wait one, two, three. Um, we need to skip basically three ticks and then finally update at four, right? So we know where how many how many ticks ahead are we? Well, we're six minus three, right? At, at this point, so we know we're three ahead. So it makes sense. We wait three ticks. Sorry, that might have been a little bit roundabout. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? I'm going to actually get into the real math part here soon. But I just wanted to explain that first. Sorry, this might be a little bit more dry than the last last subject. Okay. 
yeah, two is just um example. It's not it's not really a guess. It's just an example. The round trip time in this case would be four ticks on our clock, and the one way time would be four divided by two or or two. I just use two ticks because it's easy math. So, okay. So again, I showed that, oh, hold on. So uh, necromancy black asks, or so basically we send and time reply to work out what kind of delay it is, using that to make an estimate of the one way delay. Um, I'm not actually doing the math to estimate the delay here. I just know what it is. I've measured it separately. So imagine I did do a test at some point to see what it is. Um, I can show how to how to calculate ping. It's not too difficult. All you do is send a, a message saying I'm at say tick number one to uh, the other person. Then they send that oh, well I was at whatever one when I received uh, your one. So that means they must be off, right? Because they're they're behind. And when you receive it, it's going to be sometime in the future, and you just subtract one from whatever your tick is at that time when you receive that message that had been bounced back to you. Okay, um, but yeah, so the idea is when um, if we, we need to detect if we're ahead or behind, right? And how do we do that, right? Well, given we know what t how long it takes to send a message, right? Uh, and for now, I'm just going to I'm just going to say L for lag is how long it takes to send the message. Um, we're going to say that's a one way, right? It's going to be something, when we talk about ping here in a bit, it's the half of the ping. Um, so if we know it takes L ticks to, or lag, mm, it takes L ticks to get our message to our friend, then what will be reflected on uh, what? what will be their time when they receive our message or vice versa. Let's just go back the other way where it's easier. So if our friend sends us what's shown on their clock, uh, assume we start synchronized. We both start one at the same time. So it's going to be L plus the time on their clock when they sent it, right? Because we're synchronized. Uh, and this is say T0, so it's the initial time. Sorry, getting more math here in a bit. But this is just going to equal the time we see on our clock, right? If we're synchronized, that's an important thing. So, you know, L, uh, sorry, so let's just say uh, sending time or something. Or transmission time, but let's say sending time here. And the idea here is at T0, we send a message, we send the tick count to our friend who receives it T1. And if we are synchronized, right, say we start one here and one here, kind of hard to see. This time that passes, let us calculate what the current time will be when we receive that message, right? So L. So it's very simple math, obviously. If we start, uh, if our time zero is equal to seven, for example, and latency is equal to two again, then, then time one on our opponent's clock, not opponent, what our friend's clock is going to be equal to nine. Very simple stuff. Hopefully that's compre comprehensible. This just compensates this idea here to show how we compensate for latency, how we know what our friend's uh, clock shows, assuming we are synchronized at this point. Our clock started at the same time. Cool. Um, I hope that is not a problem. So I'm going to move on here. How, how are we doing on time? About 30 minutes so far? Cool. 
Oops. Great. But as we know before, two clocks don't necessarily start at the same time, right? So how do we actually detect if our clocks are off? And once we detect, we can then synchronize using a technique I mentioned before, right? Well, let's draw this diagram again. A little, we'll assume things are a little different now. Okay. We're sending a message again at time zero, and it's going to receive at our opponent's time one. And we know it takes L ticks for that message to be received. Well, the easiest way to think about this, if we don't start at the same time, right? Say my clock started at one, and by the time their clock started, my clock showed three or whatever. That means the difference is going to be two, right? So we know there's going to be some value that indicates the difference between our clocks, right? And we're going to call it the time offset. I'm just going to write it theta. Oops. The reason I write it theta is because that's what's used in a lot of uh, algorithms if you check online. But also, if you're familiar with any kind of like, um, like any kind of like graphing of sine waves and stuff like that, if you add, if you add to the angle, it's going to shift it back and forth. So it's going to change the phase. But we're just going to call this the time offset. Don't have to worry too much about that. The time offset shows us uh, how how skewed, you know, one clock is from another. So going back to what I explained before with uh, t1 is equal to t0 plus lag, we add another term, the time offset, right? And again, just a simple example here, if my, my time is t0 uh, is 3, right? And they started at 1 at that point. What is going to be their, well, let's assume lag is still 2, you know. If they started their, if their clock was 1 when mine said 3, well, 2 frames later, it's going to be 3, right? So for now, let's say, sorry, get my bearings here real quick. But yeah, so we can do the calculation real quick. So let's see. OK, so we don't know. Here, I'll, what I want to do is calculate the time offset. OK, so we know t1 is going to be equal to, let's, let's come up with a number. Uh, let's just say it's 1 here. OK, and then we can calculate the uh, theta pretty easily, right? Just theta is going to be equal to t1 minus t0 uh, minus L. OK, uh, and then 1 minus 3 minus 2. OK, negative 5, one minus, so it's going to be equal to negative 4. So what does that, what does that uh, theta of negative 4 here mean? What does it mean? Well, it means that we're behind by 4, right? Yeah, just to check our work here. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, we could just do 3 plus 2 plus negative 4. So t1 will be equal to 1. I hope my math's checking out there. But yeah, anyway, this gives us a method. Oh, yeah. Is that us behind by 4 or the other player behind, uh, behind us by 4? So let me name these clocks here. So it's cl let's just say this is clock 1, or clock A, and this is clock B. This is a little less confusing. Clock A and clock B. 
So clock B is behind. So you can see if I go here and just write, you know, what time was it on T1 again? I was one over here and T0 was uh, when we sent the message that was three. So it's clear that we're behind, right? It's clear that the clock only started ticking a few um, moments later, right? On, on clock B. Any questions there about how to calculate the time offset? Now what the time offset tells us is the clocks are not in sync. That's an important thing. If the uh, value of theta time offset is not zero, we're not in sync. If it's zero, if we see that it's, uh, we calculate, um, we, if you know, if we actually just do this form formula here and we see that theta is zero, then we know we're in sync. This is just a basic way to detect if the two clocks are skewed. On the context of fighting games, it means one game started later than the other. And so the number of frames that you've updated is going to not be the same. You know, player one is going to be ahead and player two is going to be behind, in, for, for example. Again, I know it's a little slow, but I want to make sure everybody gets each point and I want to make sure that I'm explaining it clearly enough. I think I mentioned in my tweet that I was going to do a little more of the implementation details of this, but it's just going to take too long to get through this explanation. So I'll do that another time. Uh, Necromancy Black asks, or it says, it could also happen if someone's system starts running slower, right? So you would just check this at the very start. Yeah, that's true. You actually. Um, I'll get to that, but yeah. So one way, of course, two clocks can be out of sync is they start at different times. But maybe, I don't know, your friend held the clock from updating, or the stopwatch from updating on one side just by accident. So that would cause a, a desynchronization, and we have to compensate for that as well. So we need to constantly check. I think as I stated before, clocks are not necessarily perfect. You know, They do get out of sync, and you need to periodically uh, check so you can synchronize. Okay, great. So this is all well and good if we know what ping is, right? If we if we've uh, somehow through a third party source or we have some you know we're checking ping through a separate message. But the truth is, the only clock that you can look at, you can't really look at other person's clock, right? Not directly. You only have your clock, right? I think this is kind of the hardest thing to wrap your head, head around. But because things take time to send messages, or it takes time to send messages over the internet, you don't know what your friend's clock is saying at that instant, right? It takes time for the message to get to you. And we have to constantly compensate for that latency. And also, network latency is constantly changing. So we have to keep compensating for it, right? We have to keep updating our latency value, our, our latency, not guess, but calculation. So what well, I was going to show you here, uh, I think I had wrote something down. Anyway, I, the idea I want to get across is you really, the only way to really synchronize two clocks when you, that's all you have is the two clocks synchronizing against, against each other, not a third party source for measuring say latency. So what happens when we don't know the latency directly already? Um, so let's 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 look at this. How can we get rid of the latency term from our formula? 
Okay. Well, let me draw this picture again for you. Right. Start time t0, t1. Okay, again, t0 is when clock A sends its time to clock B. But how do we know, how are we going to know that we're going to be synchronized with uh, clock B? Or how do we find out what time they have? Well, they have to send their time back to us, right? So after some time, uh, this is going to be our third measurement. They're going to send the message back to us saying, oh, okay. Their time at time two is some about some some number, and but we're eventually going to receive it at t three on our side or on a side. And actually, this is all we need to know really to calculate our time offset. We don't need a third party value, but for now. Let's just assume both sides, it takes the same amount of time to send information both ways. So from A to B, I'm sorry, this is in, my head's in the way, isn't it? Uh, it's gonna take time to send a message from, the same amount of time to send uh, the current tick count from A to B as it takes from B to A. And there's some time in until B sends the next tick count or what's on their clock. Okay. This is a round trip. We could calculate latency here by sending, you know, our time to them and then sending it back to us. And then we can take the difference between T3 and T0 to get latency, right? So that's one way we could do it. Let's just say latency is going to be equal to the difference between t3 and t0 divided by 2 because it's l again is our one-way trip time but actually that's not correct <laughs> it's not entirely correct that's, that's not actually the latency the actual true latency not, needs to take into account the amount of time between t2 and t1 right The problem I hope you see here is T2, T1, that this recorded times, they're in our friends, or it's in clock B's time. If the clocks are not running at the same time, or they're not updating at the same rate, or say it gets held for a bit, it's not going to be accurate, right? maybe like three ticks passed on our clock and only one tick passed on theirs. So that latency calculation isn't going to be accurate. It's going to be off because our, because we're depending our calc or we're making our calculation depend on the clock our our friend's clock rate. Right? And that's an issue. So for now, let's scratch that. We're not, we're not gonna be able to use that. We're not going to have, say for example, have our, friend sent us the time and be able to calculate accurately what the latency was. I'm going to get back to this in a little bit, but for now, just keep that issue in mind. Okay. So for now, let's not look at this. Let you worry about that. So what can we do here? Okay. Well, for now, what, what can we do? So. We're going to say that, you know, obviously, oops, wrong window. We're going to say that, uh, what is T1? T1, again, we know it's going to be equal to T0 plus one-way latency plus a time offset, right? And in the same way, actually, T3 is going to be equal to T2. It's when clock B sent their time, right? And T2 is the time reflected on B's clock, right? T3 being the time reflected on A's clock. And that's going to get 
cent and take L ticks plus the offset. It's actually plus the offset. I'm going to get to this in a second. Sorry. So actually, I need to point out something here. Um, that offset, for now, let's say there's two different time offsets. One for clock number A, or clock A, and clock B. They're going to use two different offsets for now. So theta 1, theta 2. It allows us to skew the time to be in the same timeline as the other clock, and vice versa. Okay. And remember, our goal here is to find theta. And if theta is different for each side, how do we find it? Well, let's look at this real quick. Okay. Oops. Uh, any questions there, by the way, before I move on here? I know when you start deriving a bunch of st stuff, it starts getting kind of fuzzy and hazy. But what I'm going to show you here is that the theta for each side is um, the magnitudes are equal. And one is just the other multiplied by negative one. But you'll see that here real quick. Yeah. Hopefully I remember this correctly. <laughs> okay. But so. I'm going to show you see t3 is equal to the time that t3 plus l plus the offset, right? t2 plus lag plus the time offset. But also t3 is equal to um, t0 plus the two-way lag, so 2l, because it we're counting for the time it takes to send a message to them and a message to come back. I'm trying to put everything in the time frame of clock A here. Right? So, okay, we take the initial time, T0, uh, the amount of lag, 2L here. What else do we need? Okay, we need the amount of time that passed on their side, right? So amount of time that passed on their side is T2 minus T1. And this is in their, in their, mm, in their time. Now it's, it's, it's what's shown on their clock. So it's not in terms of our it was done in terms of A's um, time offset. So what do we need to do? Okay, we need to we need to add an offset, right? So hopefully, I want to be clear here to make it not confusing. I did this yesterday. <laughs> I had a good way of writing this. Now I'm kind of questioning the way I wanted to do it to make sure I'm not making a mistake here. Well, anyway, for now, um, I just want to write, write T3 in terms of, sorry, give me a second here. How much time in the past? So I wanted to write T3 in terms of, give me a second. I was gonna do this real quick because I think it's right, but 
for some reason I'm down to myself for a bit. So I'm going to write in terms of the time maps here. If it's wrong, I'll, I'll correct it. I apologize. Anyway, um, we can get rid of T3 now, right? Um, I'm so we can get rid of T3 by writing the 2L. Oops, T2. Ugh, that's, that's terrible. Minus T1. Um, plus theta 2 is equal to, we have T3 here, right? So T2 plus L plus Actually, I did mess up here. Sorry. Oops. This was supposed to be theta 1. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Anyway, uh, we can see that the two, what can we cancel out here? Um, I messed something up here. Sorry. <laughs> uh, shit. I might have to redo this. Give me a second here. Um, I experienced the same thing in my calculus classes with professors going, well, I think I messed up there. End of class for today. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you the formula at the end anyway, so you can just look at the formula. But forgive me if I didn't derive it correctly. OK. So um, you know, we can just subtract the L, Oops, the one-way latency on that side. So we have L left. This is why I'm getting confused. So T2 is gone. Um, yeah, I think I, I'm going to probably redo this here a second. So yeah, this should be L theta 1. Sorry. OK. Um, where are we at now? Yeah. T0 plus L plus theta 1 is equal to theta 2. Yeah, so this is messed up. Sorry, I'm. What, what am I doing here? I apologize. When you're doing it live, I should have brought my notes. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna delete that real quick. I don't want to waste too much more time here for you, you guys. So I was gonna give you the formula for calculating theta, and I just wanted to kind of like prove to you that the theta on both sides is it's the, it's the same same one but for now it's going to give you the formula okay um oops give me a second here i'm going to double check my notes just to be sure um yeah so theta which is going to be the time offset is going to be equal to t1 minus t0 plus uh, T2 minus T3. I think that's right. Divided by 2. Let me double check. Yeah, that's correct. And I'll have this absolute value as well. So this is going to give us the time offset. I'm going to leave, I guess I'll leave it to you to derive it. I did it yesterday. Pfft, messing up here. But basically, I was, looking at, I was just going to show you that theta 1, theta 2. Is just going to be the same value, have the same absolute value. Um, and I just was getting mixed up in my head with clocks that are not running at the same rate. I was a little worried about that, so I didn't want to confuse any of y'all, but for, sorry about that. So uh, for now, this is the formula. Uh, if you want to look up the formula, you can just search for clock synchronization algorithm. It's on Wikipedia. But this, yeah, this is the basic idea. If you don't want to measure ping separately, you can use this to calculate the time offset. If you measure ping, you can calculate the time offset separately, like I did above, but you have to trust that ping is accurate, right? If you do this, it's in terms of your local clock, right? It tells you how the two clocks are skewed, right? 
Now this works if you assume that any you know clock desynchronization is just a temp it's just temporary. It's not an ongoing thing. Um, say that while the message is being sent and received, that it does drop a frame. It does work, but if it's like if the rate update is off, it can be bad. Yes, exactly. So when you're on network, oh well, when you're talking about network communication, is the time um, to send information again is variable, it's dynamic. It's not always going to be the same. Yeah, so clocks can drift. It's an important thing. I have two cups. I should have poured the coffee here. I'm sorry, man. I'm fading. I got up really early this morning, and yesterday we had an earthquake, which woke me up early as well. So. Um, so yeah, we have that one. I'm going to check my notes real quick. Okay. Um, so this gives us a way to calculate the time offset. But for our purposes here though, actually, what we want to know is the time offset. Is it is it positive or negative? If we take the absolute value, um, it doesn't help us that much, right? We need to know if we're ahead of our opponent so that we can, again, stop our clock and let them catch up. So you can kind of just ignore the absolute value in this case because basically we're just checking to see it, if uh, theta is greater than zero. So you can kind of just scratch this. Just use this to calculate. The time offset, right? This is going to be theta one. Ma. Well, anyways, it's a theta for you <laughs> on the side that's doing the calculation. That's the important thing. The other side will be the opposite value. Oops, that's my head is blocking that again. Sorry. My pin color changed. Okay. Go to blue now. So our test, and we're talking about like actually synchronizing two game clients. Our test is to see if theta is um, is, it, is it greater than zero? Oh, it's greater than zero. Whoops. I should write the parentheses around here just to be understandable. <laughs> it's not even the same color. Uh, everything is going up Millhouse. Coming up Millhouse, as they say. Give everybody to absorb it. Have some time to absorb it. Give myself some time to absorb it as well. Okay, so this is the basic theory about finding out whether or not um, our game clients are desynchronized time wise. This has nothing to do with desynchronization when it comes to game state. It has a whole other issue. This is just about the timing of the two clients. And when we find out that we're ahead, we can have our client, the game client, the actual software that's running on the computer, pause to let the opponent catch up. And we're going to want to keep checking this continuously. Now, the other thing I wanted to cover later on was the actual, you know, the, the actual practice of implementing this stuff in code. Because uh, there's something we need to show, like, if we're just checking this every frame all the time, it's going to be highly dependent on the network conditions. It's going to, as the network fluctuates, there's a chance we're going to synchronize way too often. We want to avoid that. Uh, but I'm not going to cover that today. I didn't want to do another two hour talk. So um, if you guys have any questions, um, y'all have any questions, just go ahead and ask and I'll try my best to answer. But yeah, this is just the, the general theory of it for figuring out whether or not we need to synchronize and actually how how many frames or how many ticks we need to synchronize. Theta is going to tell you that. Once theta is equal to zero, we know we're synchronized. Or 
in the real world, we're going to have a tolerance. We're not going to try to like actually synchronize perfectly because it's basically impossible to verify, but you can, you can get close. You're going to have a threshold. Um, and that's going to depend on uh, the game creators, you know, how, how they, uh, how they feel, uh, what's important for their game, you know. Everything's kind of a balance, you know. Do you want to synchronize more and cause potential less stability? Or do you uh, hold off on it and only synchronize so often? You can do this on a timer, right? O only check at fixed intervals. So you can make those synchronizations less obvious to the player. Again, this is just a theory part. So the practice, in practice, all the stuff that you do to make sure that synchronization is smooth and not as noticeable to the or not noticeable player as much as possible, that's difficult as well, and that requires a bit of not too much difficult math, but it can be tricky. Yeah, sorry that this part was very dry, <laughs> the, but again, this is just the general theory of it. And if you're interested in this stuff, just search for like network time protocol, or sorry, is it network? clock synchronization or clock synchronization algorithm. Search for those keywords online. You can find plenty of informa information on this. There's a whole you know, subject of this stuff that if you really want to get two clocks that are over a, a inherently laggy network to com or you know, communication line to, to synchronize, there's all kinds of stuff out there going into a lot of detail. And I don't know if all of it's important for for games. I don't know if we need to be that precise, but I'm sure somebody out there is going to do something much better than what's been done before. The question is, like, is it noticeable to a player, to the players? And it requires a lot more testing and experience and uh, feedback. So, yeah, any questions? I think I'm coming up on about a little over an hour here, so. And I had to get some work done. I have lunch to get some work done, so. Yeah, sorry again for that part being very dry. Next part is going to be more coding. So. I'll give you a little bit of time here if you want to ask any questions. Other than that, I'm going to send out pretty soon. Now let's give you, uh, just chill out for five minutes here. Sorry, I messed up on the um, the revision of the uh, theta, but it doesn't take a lot of work to figure out that the thetas are equal in magnitude. When you start implementing this code, you do have to be careful about which variables are in which frame of reference, right? And also, I wanted to show that you can you can you can actually calculate clock synchronization without recording a separate ping. This is yeah, this is for fighting games. So clock synchronization among multiple clients is a different thing. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but I think the most straightforward way is to have a common clock that you all communicate with it has the most con consistent latency right I haven't worked on too many I've done a few I haven't worked on too many like multi or you know more than two player games at least not on the synchronization part so I don't know if they actually have the need to do any clock synchronization. I wonder if uh, Overwatch does that because they do some type of deterministic um, prediction to to synchronize games. But they also do have uh, server authoritative synchronization as well. With server authoritative synchronization, you don't need, as far as I'm aware, you don't need clock synchronization as much. It only becomes a problem because we're trying to reduce the amount of rollbacks and uh, on, on one client versus the other. We're trying to even them out. 
And to do that, we have to make sure the clocks or the games update at the same time on the same frame. Um, yeah, I mean, eight players. We're, you know, we're talking about fighting games. I mean, obviously, there's a limit to this type of lockstep determinist, deterministic simulation, right? The game's going to be as laggy as the most laggy connection, right? Um, depending on how you simulate it, though, like it could be that one player is more laggy than another. You could do separate synchronization, right? This is kind of the things I haven't spent much time on, not eight player type games, so it's not something I've had to worry about so much. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you got to think about what you're going to prioritize for your game. And something like eight players, maybe it's just better to have a central server. But yeah, more than two players is kind of out of the scope of what I'm talking about here. I would have a central server that is the authoritative... Um, the authority of truth over what the current time is. If we're, if we're just talking about clock synchronization, I'm not even talking about game state synchronization, which is you probably want to do that as well. Fighting games have a lot of states, so that might be tricky, but. Oh. Yeah, understanding limitations on the engineering side is very important, you know. You know, limitations can lead to a lot of creative design too. You know. I think you should think of it, especially designer, you shouldn't think of it like, well, engineering's holding me back. You really should think about what are your design perimeters and try to be creative within there. And of course you can try to push back and maybe create if you have any creative ideas, you can kind of overreach what's possible or extend the boundaries so it's a little extract here but i hope, hope you know what i mean but in general yeah when i've done design work having the limitations has really set the stage for what i can do and it actually helps quite a bit when you have you know when the world is your oyster and you can do anything which is not true anywhere but conceptually it's actually much harder to design i think design basically is coming up with solutions to problems in the most general case and working with limitations is a problem to solve, right? If you want to have a type of game, but your limits are this, like how do you make it work within that? You know, I think that's really cool. It's really fun, actually. It's not so much I have an idea and put it out into the world. It's more like, well, what are we trying to do? How do we make that possible? And I, I think it's a really important skill for designers to have. But you'd be surprised how late into a project people realize what their limitations are, you know, and that ends up being a huge issue in a lot of games. Oh, the actual practical implementation of the clocks. Fighting games is very simple. It's just a frame count. So you start clock counting from zero, you know, zero, and then once you do the first update, that's one two, three, four, five, and so on, so on, so on, each time you update the game. And you use those counts as the tick count in the previous examples, right? Yeah, we don't count CPU cycles for fighting games. They're like locked 60 FPS, locked 60 hertz. they're constantly dropping frames well it's like at what point do you want to keep playing a match with that person you know if they can't maintain 60 frame fps you know should you really be playing a match with them you can synchronize to that and we could smooth it out over time but you know for example if they're just dropping a frame once every you know 60 
frames or so. That's you know, 59 frames per second. Is it that that terrible? Maybe not. But once you get down to like oh, 55, 50 frames a second, it's going to start feeling. It's either going to be very jittery, stuttery on the your uh, um, opponent's side as they're synchronizing to you, or you could smooth it out and their game's just going to slow down. Right? It depends how you do it. And it's like, what do you want as a game creator? You know, what do you think your players want? Is it going to be worth the effort to support that and make it better for the players? Maybe give them a choice. I tend to be on the side of player choice, but, you know, at the end of the day, you have budget and time constraints, you know. So, yeah, it's just one of the design decisions you have to make, production decisions that somebody has to make at, at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, packets do arrive out of order, but there there are things to deal with that. That's kind of like not really the issue of the clock synchronization. Really, there's a ways around it. In the actual implementation, you're going to kind of be averaging out a lot of these time differences in these formulas to make sure that like a wild packet out of order or a sun packet that took like way too long to come in doesn't force you to synchronize. Um, yeah, you, you shouldn't respond just to one packet, basically. You don't need to be that uh, responsive to that stuff. It's, probably, it's not good, <laughs> actually. And you can get in feedback loops where you're you know, your opponent didn't actually drop a frame, but because of network latency, it maybe it would have seemed that way. Uh, and then you synchronize, but that's going to cause your opponent to see that you now you're behind and they're going to synchronize and you can get into this feedback loop if you're too responsive to uh, the network traffic, which is what you really don't want to do, actually. But that's more of the implementation details, how, how we actually do this in practice. Um, if I do another talk, I'll cover that stuff. Hopefully, I think that's going to be a much longer stream, unfortunately. Like, I was thinking, like, at least two hours, really, if, if you want to get into it. Because I, I, I want to show actual code running and and uh, the kind of debug data we'll be looking at uh, when we're trying to, like, debug those issues, you know. Okay, well, guys, it's uh, gals and everybody else. It's getting close to that time. I know it's getting later out there on the East Coast. Uh, it's still pretty early on the West Coast, right? But yeah, um, hopefully I can do another one of these. And if uh, this was useful to you, awesome. If not, I'll just leave the feedback and uh, maybe I'll come up with something else that's useful. So, yeah, again, thanks for stopping by. I hope you learned something. And uh, until next time, good night, and see you again soon. Peace.